It's the voice of the one and only DJ Scream, letting you know that you are now in tune to the Casual Flex, where culture meets sports and casuals are welcome. Now here's your host, Philip Dukes. Yo, welcome to the Casual Flex. I'm your host, Philip Dukes, aka Dukes D Scoop. Check me out on Instagram and Twitter at Dukes D Scoop, and make sure you go down here and like and subscribe. Today, I got one of the most revered quarterbacks in Auburn history and one of the best uh, quarterbacks that you saw of uh, African-American heritage to go into the NFL, and that's Jason Campbell. J. Cam, what's up, bro? Yo, what's up, man? Just trying to, you know, trying to work and grind and, uh, you know, trying to get Auburn some help, get Auburn some players. And But, you know, overall, man, it's been a fun time. Uh, I've been enjoying this process. Uh, it's you know it's a different world out here. You know, right. It is a different world. It's not the same world we came up through. Uh, we was getting ready to come to college and get uh and get acclimated, but it's a good change. It's a good change as long as it's handled in the right way. So we we talking about the change, like so. I'm assuming you're talking about nil, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's your role with on to victory the the major collective for Auburn's nil? And uh, where do you want to see that go? Yeah, you know, NIL is a big part of uh, college football, college basketball, baseball, soccer, whatever you want to name any sport. NIL plays a big part now because a lot of kids want to, you know, make money off their name, image and likeness. And like most of like it's, it's not pay for play, but as well as you know that if you're on the field and you're playing or you're in the basketball game and your name is coming up on the scoreboard and people are seeing it on ESPN and CBS, that makes your value more marketable. So it gives you an opportunity to make a little bit more for yourself in the NIL realm. Uh, for me, I'm kind of like a GM of, of NIL for us. Uh, mostly I kind of make sure the guys are doing their requirements, make sure they're where they're supposed to be when they're supposed to be there. Uh, also helping break down the contracts and everything with, um, you know, with our collective. Uh, make sure we're all on the same page from a communication standpoint, but also just helping these kids understand, you know, what their value is as well, you know, on the field and off the field. And I also use this opportunity to be a mentor to a lot of these young guys. Uh, you know, I've been in a lot of them shoes. I you know, played college football. I played in the NFL. And so I try to be, you know, an open book for them as well, you know, outside of talking about finances, but, you know, just talking about, you know, man to man, what to expect and, and what you got to do and, and and really be honest with these guys, man. That's the that's the main thing. Everybody, you know, think they're going pro. And I tell them, I say, I'm not trying to mess up anyone's dreams. I say, but we also have to be reality about all of this. And the fact is that, you know, only about, you know, 95 percent of the guys that come through that door don't get a shot to play in the National Football League. Mm -hmm. I say, but. You still have an opportunity to get ahead in life because I tell them NIL is great starter money to life. I say, but NFL is your life changing generational family money. I say, mm. but even if you don't get to the NFL after you made NIL money for four years, you need to learn how to budget while you're in college. You need to learn how to put yourself to be disciplined. So when you come out of school, that you are already ahead. 98 percent of kids that come out of college are already in debt because of what student loan debt. Mm. You get a chance to come out of college and everything. Don't have to worry about paying back student loan debt, but you also have a great start to life. So it puts you ahead of 98 percent of the people in the world. And I know a lot of folks will say, well, then why do they get paid? Well, at the end of the day, they still deserve to get paid because the school makes a lot of money off of what, what these kids do from a standpoint of what they do on the field, on the court, off the you know, the baseball, soccer, all of that stuff. So, you know, you still have to there, – there's an equal value here. Yes, you you get an education, but a lot of these guys, they have to balance practice. They have to balance the game. They have to – they can't go get a job because they're practicing or they're preparing for a game. And, uh, and then they still got to study. They still got to write papers. They still got to do all these different things that's required of them so life doesn't stop. So, you know, where a normal student, they can go get a job if they wanted to. And I remember back when I was in school, show you couldn't even get a job. You can, if you did, you couldn't work no more than three hours a week. I was like, how are you going to make money? <laughs> you know, right, so, right. You know, so it, it's a great benefit if they use it right. And as well as you know, man, anytime that we talk about money or anytime money is involved in anything, it can also be a plus for a lot of people. But then some people, it can be a crutch because, you know, it causes some people to have confrontation with one another 
because of that issue. And uh, and that's why I say being in this position, man, kind of gives me an opportunity to break a lot of this stuff down to a lot of parents and a lot of, you know, family mentors, trainers, owners, coaches, agents. That's the other thing. Agents is involved in this now. And uh, and I think the NCA does need to get some type of parameters on it, uh, because right now it's really hard on these coaches to be able to coach a kid and not know if he's going to be there next year because he could have that one year transfer right. or he go anywhere else. So if the kid, you know, so there's a thing called how do you know if a kid's going to commit to you for four years? How do you know he's going to be loyal to you for four years? And, uh, you know, I know coaches can come and go at the same time, but, you know, we're in this position right now that, you know, it's always a wait and see game. You put your best foot forward. You hope that, you know, the kid is enjoying himself and everything, but cause you want this kid for four years so you can help develop him. you know? And uh, right. so, you know, a lot of people don't, they're not patient enough. Cause most of the kids, you're a freshman, man, you're coming in, there's a learning curve to this on the field and off the field. So we just got to understand that patience is still a virtue. So when it comes down to NIL, for those that don't know, how does NIL really work? Like Mm -hmm. when do incoming freshmen actually get an NIL check? Like how does the NIL system work? And NIL being name, image, and likeness for those that don't know, but how does that really work? Yeah, it works from the standpoint of like a kid has to first be enrolled in school. Okay. So before he can actually come to our office and sign an NIL contract, he has to first and foremost, he has to be enrolled and then he has to attend class for a full for a full day. And, uh, and once he's gone to enrolled and once he's gone to class and now he's a full time Auburn student, then at that point he can come by our NIL office and then sign his contract. And then once he comes by, he review it. He reviews his contract. Our office review the contract with him. Our office sit down with these kids. They go through everything with the kids. We also have an accounting side that we talk to our kids about and say, hey, because you're not an employee, we can't force you to take taxes out of your check. But you can allow us to take taxes out of your check if you agree to it for us to do that for you. So that way, at the end of the year, you're not worrying about how much money I owe on taxes or trying to go figure out that I spend too much money because I did because I didn't hold anything back for taxes. So we try to let those kids and we, we always hope that they allow us to take the taxes out of their checks before they receive them, because that way, because that way it uh it helps them to grow and it helps them create a budget for themselves. You know, once they understand how much they're getting each month after taxes, now you can kind of create a budget. How much can I put in savings? What I need to live off of? So we try to do all those things for them and helping them not just receive money, but educate them about what they're getting and how to handle it. And uh, we also have a marketing side of it that we're able to try to go out in the community and find marketing opportunities for these kids. And, you know, we don't make any money off of it because we're not their agents. We're in NIL here to help our student athletes. But if they have an agent, now they got to pay an agent fee for that if he goes out and find it. But if we go out and find something for them, they don't have to pay us for that. So, you know, that's their money. We just got to make sure that their requirements match so that they don't get in trouble and if they stay in line with compliance from NCAA standpoint. So as a alumni of Auburn, myself, and somebody who works every day for my hard-earned money, <laughs> what is what is your pitch to Auburn alum, Auburn fans, period, to say, you know what, come to On the Victory. If you want to see a good product on the field, give some money to On the Victory so we can make sure that we can compete with the rest of the schools in the country. What is On the Victory's pitch to Auburn fans in order for them to donate money. Yeah, that's the thing. It's either like I always tell people, it's either get involved, stay on the porch or or get in the car and ride. You know, mm. from this standpoint, like this is the way college football is going and it's not going anywhere. And, you know, you can't sit at home and complain if we don't have the same amount of athletes as the Georgia and the Bamas and the LSUs because they're getting ahead of us from an NIL standpoint. If you don't, if we don't get involved as as a community then you can't fuss if we're not competing for championships. You right. know, uh, so if you want us to win and you want us to have an opportunity to, to have a winning program, then we need to be able to compete as well in the NIL format to make sure that that's not a reason that we're losing, you know, right. that we have all the resources that we need and everything. And yes, you always have your big guys that, that help out and everything, but, you know, NIL has created an opportunity for people to go and, and subscribe and they can be as, as small as $30 a month or as large as a thousand dollars a month, you know, it just all depends on what you're comfortable with. And it's just not for people that went to Auburn 
is even if you love Auburn, you just love Auburn, you're just a fan of Auburn, you want to get involved, it gives you the opportunity to do that. And I always tell people, you know, they always ask me, so where do we go? I said, well, you can go on the website, on to victory, nil.com and or on to victory.com and it is and you will see it and it'll show you like the different subscription levels and, and different things that you can do uh from that standpoint if you want to get involved but that's the name of the game man it's just you know i, I know a lot of people are not on board with it and there are some that are on board with it but a lot of these kids do need help and after being involved with this there are a lot of kids that that have some troubles back at home that they you know mom or dad may not be there you know right and everything they need help to help a sister or brother or they need help to help a mom or something with a light bill or you know a water bill or something because they used to be there in high school and they was able to work and make a little money to pay one or two bills and everything now they've exempt from the home and now that mom still depends on them to be able to help them a little bit and everything so a lot of these people a lot of these kids are married some of these kids have gotten married in college and you know some of them have kids and they got to be able to provide for their children so you know, there's a lot of stories out there. I know a lot of people say, man, these guys get everything, but it's not true. They they work extremely hard, but there are some that that really, really need it, man. And it, and it definitely takes a lot of pressure and stress off these guys where they can kind of focus on their academics and they can kind of focus on the field when they're practicing and getting ready for games because they don't have that added pressure and stress from home. So uh, that's the biggest thing about NIL that I've seen it do for a lot of these kids and everything. I try to talk them out of lavish stuff, you know, like – worrying about cars and houses and all that. I try to talk them out of that. I say, look, man, like still keep the main thing, the main thing, you know, mm. get to college, graduate, you know what I'm saying? Like get your academics, practice, work hard, you know, try to compete and win championships. And then if you have a chance to play at the next level, go all the way forward. You know, I was just like, you know, that's your dream. Shoot for it. I was just like, but at the same time, you know, make sure you keep the main thing, the main thing. NIL, like I said, it's starter money to life. Create an opportunity for yourself. It's not your know, generational money. You're trying to work towards that. But at the same time, you need to keep the main thing, the main thing, so you don't lose focus and sight on why you're here. What made you want to get involved with NIL in the first place? Yeah, that was a lot of it. Uh, I know I started doing CBS up in New York and, and NBC, Washington up in uh, D.C. and covering some of the commander stuff. But you know, I, I, Auburn called me and got tied in doing the Auburn Sports Radio, started about five years ago. And then, you know, I got tied into once they started NIL, you know, at first I didn't really know what it was. I was trying to learn a little bit about it. And then I kept hearing more about it. And they reached out to me and said, hey, you know, we'd like for you to come on board, you know, to help our athletes and everything uh, in this NIL space. You know, you've seen a lot of it. You've been through a lot of it. You know what? agents are looking for you know what all the marketing stuff looks like you know what percentages and different things look like and we just kind of need your help uh with communication and, and helping us uh, get this thing going in the right way because they want to run it extremely uh positive and, and in the right way as they possibly can and uh and we have the right people in place to do that we're probably one of the top three nils in the nation mm. uh for the format of what we do and how we do it uh, and everything and uh, how we communicate with our kids and, and the requirements that they have to do, uh, just making sure that they're also being professional. I said, if you want to be paid like professional, treated like professionals, I said, most of you guys in here make more money than the average person on a job that's in their mid 40s and 50s already. Right. I like, I said, but the sad thing is, dude, is the thing is, a lot of these guys going to leave here and they're going to end up making less money when they get in the real world. Because when they get in the real world, it's a competition. It's a different style of competition. And that's why I say you better make sure you get that degree while you had an opportunity to get it. I said, because you don't want that to be a reason you don't get a job. I like because you have that opportunity. I said, but at the end of the day, these kids don't understand how hard it is to somebody to say, when you get out of high school, hey, we're going to start you off at 45000 50000 You know, they're going to be looking, <laughs> right. They're going to be looking like, what? What you mean? Right. You know, because... You know, they're not accustomed to it. And right. that's the other thing is, that's why I say, but you can be ahead, even if that was the case, and work your way up because you have some cushion. I said, but if you leave out of here and you don't have any cushion for yourself and you start right back from where you ended out of high school, I said, it's going to be your own fault because you didn't listen to the things that people try to teach you and learn how to understand to be disciplined enough because you got to learn how to take care of a little before you can learn how to take care of a lot. Amen. And, and that's what a lot of them don't understand. I say, how can you ask for more if you don't know how to take care of what you have now? It's the right. same thing in the real world. 
I like some people wonder why they don't have certain things. It's probably because you didn't learn how to take care of what you got now right. like, and, and have gratitude for it. So, um, you know, it's just a great, that's what got me into this space to be able to be a mentor, be able to help out and also let these kids know that, look, money don't make you happy. Yes, it can help you out of some situations. Yeah, it can help you buy certain things that you want to buy. But at the end of the day, it can't be your be all got it. And that's my all. Like, let's, let's talk about the fit. Do you fit at the university? Do you like the university? Like, that's my first and foremost thing. When you come to the university, like, how did, what's your relationship look like with the coach? You know, can you right. sit in the room and talk with the coach and have a conversation? And let the, and can the coach be hard on you without you running away? Man. You know? So there's so many things that they forget about, like what's your fit, what's your relationship? I said, because you got to be happy wherever you come to do your work at every day. You got to make sure that's a place you want to be and be happy. I like, so don't allow yourself to be bought by nobody. I right. said, I said, make sure that's a place you want to be first and then make sure, OK, from an NIL standpoint, we can help you and everything. But understand, too, though, there's parameters. There's a budget. This is not free falling money off the trees and everything that you can just. People just pay you whatever. This money comes from hardworking people just like yourself that have money or don't have money, but just you know doing what they can, but just trying to help out. There's people that make $30,000 a year and they may give us $1,000 a year towards NIL. Uh -huh. And there's people that you know, that make millions. You know, they may you know give some money as well to help out NIL. But either way you cut it, it's coming from someone's hard work that they created that they don't have to do. And that's where we've gotten to. People don't have to do anything. Right. If they didn't want to get involved with NIL, they could say everybody across the world and just say, I'm not going to do it. What you going to do? you going to stop playing? you going to quit? <laughs> right. Are you going to do what we did before it was NIL? you going to bust your tail and work hard and right. try to get to that next level. But a lot right. of these kids have forgotten that hard work because they think it's all guaranteed and they think that it's just a guarantee that I'm going to get this. Yeah, when you come to our NIL, whatever we say you're going to get, once you sign your NIL contract and we're on campus and we review your contract, yeah, we're going to make sure you get it because we have a reputation to uphold. But right. there's no guarantees that people have to get involved. Right. That's why I said have some gratitude. Right. No, absolutely. So Auburn has a new head coach, Hugh Freeze. How has Hugh Freeze uh, uh, adopted or adapted to the new landscape? And how does he really embrace NIL as a whole at Auburn. Well, you can tell Hugh Freeze gets it, man. You can tell he's been a coach in the SEC before. You can tell he knows how to how to build a football team. If everyone's been following us, you also know that how we right now rank the third in the nation in transfer portal. You know, and that number's right. going to go up. We got some other guys that's on their way that uh, that they're working on right now. So, you know, it just goes to show you that a lot of them have been offensive linemen and defensive linemen, and the game is won in the trenches. You just saw that. Uh, Monday night, how Georgia looked so dominant over TCU because just look at the powers up front. You know, right. the holes, there was time Bennett was untouched. And at most of the game, he probably wasn't even touched hardly at all, even in the passing game. Because right. of that offensive line and that defensive line, they got, you know, just created problems. And uh, and that's the difference in the SEC. If you want to win in the SEC, yes, you can have all your Lamborghinis and all that fancy stuff on the outside and behind the center and in the running game. But if you don't have those dolls, those – bulldozers up front you're not winning and mm. uh and that and that's the thing they have approached to build this team and everything and uh so he gets it man and he understands recruiting i like he's there from morning to night all the coaches not just him all the coaches are there like they really dedicated themselves so hard since he's come on board you know and all the coaches he's brought up brought in and even the ones that stayed back like lack and zach and you know t reed and all those guys like they're all busting their tails to make sure that we all get ahead and get back to playing Auburn football and winning football and uh, and everything. So, you know, I just feel like the the pre-regime, I don't think they was all the way bought in or they just didn't understand the magnitude of what it's like to recruit in the South mm. against LSU, Georgia's and Tennessee's. You can't sit back and think people just going to come because we're Auburn. You got to get out there and bust your tail and get involved and get in with the party. And, uh, and I think that's the difference now is that Coach Freeze wants to be here. Coach Freeze – this is his destination that he's been dreaming to get to. And, uh, you know, he's a guy that's not looking to go anywhere else. And I think you're going to see him put his best foot forward because he's recruiting like that. And the whole staff is recruiting like that because there's chemistry among the staff. 
everybody flows with one another and uh and the communication from from everyone it, it had just been uh you know these last the month and since he's been here you know people had just been working extremely hard man that's good to hear from uh for auburn fans and so for auburn fans that want to know you know what i want to put some money with nil and they're kind of on the uh on the edge of saying you know what i make i make two thousand dollars a week mm -hmm. where can i find an extra 125 so i can give 500 dollars a month how long does you do you think that it takes for Auburn to compete with the Georgias and the Alabamas of the world? Well, right now we already are. Uh, just because of the simple fact there's been some people, man, that really stepped up and like I mean, stepped up, they stepped up and got involved heavily. And uh because they just love their university. Um, that's been the reason why we've been able to to get a lot of these guys and uh and everything, because you know, our NIL has done an outstanding job, man, of uh, being involved with making sure we we get what who we need and, and from the sources that we need and uh, and everything. So we're already there. It's just a matter of everyone just continuing to stay involved. Everyone just continuing to get involved with the format and everything because we can't back down. We can't back off. We can't slow down. You just can't. Not in today's world of uh, collegiate athletes and the way that kids transfer left and right and the way that, you know, you have to make sure the kids have these resources and everything because it is a big question. You know, there's times sometimes kids, want, when they come on visit, they want to know about NIL before anything else. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, go meet, <laughs> go meet with the coach first. Go see the facilities. Go talk to who you need to talk to. Learn about what it is to be an Auburn Tiger, what it's like to be an Auburn man. I just like see if this is where you want to be first, see if you fall in love with the place, see if this is in your heart. I said, and then you can talk about what NIL opportunities can be available for you if you came to Auburn. I was just right. like, and everything. I said, because we, we can't go that route first. I was just like, because, you know, what reason are you coming for then? We want to make sure you love putting that helmet on with the AU on the side of it too, you know, right. first and foremost, because – when the tough gets, when the hard gets going and it gets tough sometimes, we don't have to worry about you quitting or giving up because your heart was in, in the right place in the first place. You wanted to be here. Right. If it was like that would make the NFL. Like if you was if it was about a check, right. you would have went to like you can go anywhere and get a check. But right. Auburn is a special place. And it, it makes me feel good as somebody who graduates from Auburn to know that that's being put in the forefront and so let's let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about Jason Campbell, the quarterback. Now, Jay Cam, like when you were in school, like you had so much hype around you. Like, if you were to come out today, how much money do you think you'd be worth NIL? Dude, man, man, these kids come out now, like if because I was ranked the number two quarterback in the nation in high school. Right. And uh, the number 11 recruit overall uh, when I signed with Auburn. So I just know, like, nowadays, man, like, you at least talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars, you know, for a five-star quarterback. You know, right. Uh, you know, just off reality. You know, just that's just based off what we're seeing across the nation. Right. And, uh, it is a leading position and everything. But at the same time, like, you have to understand, like, how much of this is going to be sustainable across the nation. Because what happens is – People want to see victories. People want to see wins. You know, if you don't start winning and having victories and stuff, people are going to be like, well, then we're giving what we're giving to what for? If we're not getting you know, the product produced and everything. Right. You know, like I can tell them, I say, well, you know, it's supposed to be for name, image, and likeness, not, not pay for play. But at the same time, people do understand, like, hey, we still want to see some, some results. We want some everything. wins. We want some wins, you know, and everything. Right. And that's what I always try to tell. You know, these guys, man, I like, man, you're fortunate enough to be in a position that you're in uh, just because of, uh, you know, just because of your hard work. Now, don't stop working hard, you know, because this this is what you're making in college, not going to take care of you for a lifetime. Right. You know, so, so keep that in front of you. All right. So you come to Auburn, year 2000. Who was the best athlete that you saw on that team? Athlete <laughs> overall, offense or defense? The best overall athlete that you saw in Auburn when you got to Auburn? Man, I signed myself. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. 
Yeah, I used to play basketball too. So I posed a Carlos Dance with myself both signed the Auburns to play basketball and football. Right. And you know, we both were supposed to play basketball when our first season was over with. But hey, hold on, let me stop you. So are you saying that Carlos Dansby was the best athlete outside of yourself at Auburn when you got there? No, nah, running B, running B was a good athlete too. Running was a baseball player and right. a football player. Like running supposed to play on the baseball team and right. uh, everything. So he was an athlete. Carlos Roger was an athlete. Carlos Roger was a basketball player in high school and football. Uh, right. Adelaide was an athlete. You know, Lack could, you know, Lack was fast. He could run. Uh, like we had a lot of guys, man, that uh, that could have been like two sport guys, right? Uh, so you can only play one, but uh, but now nah, we definitely had some athletes though, for sure. Even uh, Marcus McNeil, Big Mark, yeah, right, Mark played basketball and football, yeah, you know? six eight like, with it. Like, we've yeah. been at he always wanted to bring the ball down the court. I'm like, bro, yeah. give me the ball, bro, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so big Mark a ball, you know, people can't even forget about that. So, right, uh, we definitely had some guys though, man. Let's talk about this. When you get to the NFL, what was your welcome to the NFL moment? <laughs> Shoot, I had to take some offensive linemen out to eat, and everybody talking about uh, I got to take care of the bill of my own. <laughs> how, much, how, how much was it? Man, the bill was almost well, almost ten grand or something. Then ten thousand. Yeah, and I was just so upset. I'm mad, trying to let <laughs> it off, and act like I'm enjoying myself. And I'm just like. Man, all y'all old vets, man, been in here making money for years. I like, I just got here. Y'all already trying to take money. <laughs> yeah, so that was my that was one moment. And then uh as far as playing football was, you know, we was playing the Giants my first year. I uh, got a chance to start. Um, and it was like my third game starting or something. We played the Giants and the guy named Blackburn. I know his last name was Blackburn. I was going, I was running, and that joker caught me right in the middle of my slide going down. And it was one of the hardest hits I took taken. And uh, I remember getting up like today, they call it a concussion. Back then, you just kind of go to the sideline or you shake it off a little bit and it gives you some smelling sauce and, <laughs> uh, you, and you back out there. You know what I'm saying? But now if you get any kind of wooziness or whatever, they take you out and, you know, take four or five days for them to decide they're going to play you the next week or not. And so when it comes down to it, like we talked about like uh, concussions and targeting and all of that, like, Today's game is a little bit different, but it's still really, really physical. Mm -hmm. What made, like, when you retired, you still had years left. Mm -hmm. Was the physicality of the game a part of the reason that you retired? Yeah, for me, and my left knee. You know, like I said, I had a torn meniscus. I had a torn ACL in that knee. I've had a uh, patella, dislocated patella tendon. Uh, you know, it's just a lot, you know, and then – I had about six or seven um, stingers in my left neck, um, you know, so the wear and tear was just kind of kind of tiresome. And then after I've been in the league for 10 years, I had a chance to go play for two more. Uh, Baltimore was trying to get me for two more. Uh, Cincinnati wanted me to come back. But I just told him I was just kind of tired because I got to a point, too, where I really just didn't want to learn another playbook. You know, mm. I took a different offense for four years at Auburn. You know, people don't realize how hard that is. You know, to always having to keep learning while you're playing. You don't ever just get a chance to just get ahead and move to phase two and three in the offense because you're always having to start over. And right. um, I think after doing that for four years at Auburn and doing that for like six years out of my 10 years in the NFL, I was just kind of exhausted. I mean, you know, exhausted. And I think at that time, I just didn't have the energy or the the will to just want to keep doing it. Like, I, from an athletic standpoint, shoot, I was physically enough to still be able to do it for another five years. Right. But from a mental standpoint, I was done. And right. I knew I couldn't go out there on that football field and play with grown men that do this for a living and be halfway in and halfway out. And uh, so at that point, I just made the decision. I said, God has blessed me uh, to be in a position I'm in. You know, I've saved my money and everything. And, uh, and you know, I just felt like it was the right time to just move on, you know, and not just keep doing it when I wasn't all the way in it. So you played with Sean Taylor, who passed away tragically, mm -hmm. and one of the great safeties, and a lot of people talk about how hard he hit. Yeah. As somebody who prays against him without having to get hit by him, tell us about how good Sean covered Sean, excuse me, Sean Taylor was in coverage. Yeah, Sean was long. That's what people don't realize. You know, Sean was pretty much almost 6'4", as a safety, could run like a deer. 
you know, his wingspan was was very long. And I don't know how much I don't know how many fines he would have got if he was playing in today's game, because when he hits you, he goes through you. And right. uh, and I seen him put the fear into to receivers before. And uh, guys didn't want to come over the middle, you know, because they kind of look over the shoulder while they're trying to look at the ball coming because they want to know where 21 was and, right. uh, and everything. So he definitely made a huge difference in the defense. And uh, he would have been one of the at least top three safeties up there with Ed Reach or Palomalu, Ronnie Lott. He'd have been right up there with those guys um, from a whole career standpoint. It's just unfortunate that we weren't able to see it all the way through uh, because of something tragic that happened. Uh, but one thing about Sean is he worked hard in practice. I remember he used to get me, he's AJ, can you stay out of practice? And, uh, you know, can we work on some things? So I would stay out of practice with him and I would line up and he say, act like you're throwing a go ball, but don't show me which way you're throwing it. Just kind of drop back normal and then just launch it like you're throwing a go route. And I would drop back normal and I wouldn't look at, I wouldn't look to either side, I look straight down the middle, hold him in the middle. And then I would turn and launch it. And then this guy would catch the ball four yards before it goes out of bounds on the side. Oh, wow. And that's how fast and his 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 length was. And I remember we played the Green Bay Packers in uh, 2007 in Lambeau. And I think he had like two or three picks against Brett Favre. And two of them was on some go balls down the sideline. And it took me back to when we was on the – after practice, when I throw the go ball, how fast he can cover from width of the field. I think uh, it's the same thing. He shot Brett Favre because Brett Favre had a strong arm. Right. And I said he could still get over there and intercept those balls. I think he realized, like, hey, man, this dude here, he's different. You know, this is a different guy. So just imagine an Ed Reed but taller. Just imagine, mm. you know, a running lot that can hit but taller. You know, you combine right. all of that and, you know, you get a Sean Taylor. And uh, even to this day, you know, kids still recognize him because, you know, people have done a really good job of keeping his – you know, his name going and, uh, right. and everything. I just remember watching something in Washington a couple of weeks ago. I couldn't go uh, when they did something for him up there in Washington, his memorial and everything. Right. And his little daughter. And I remember she was born when we was up there and she was just a baby. And now, you know, she's what, 17? I mean, you know, that's 15, a teenager or whatever. Now it just makes you realize how fast the years have flown by. Cause I'm just like, man, you know. Man, don't remind me, but you see how this great. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, man, time is flying. You know, you see her stand on the field and everything and realize, like, man, she was a baby. And I'm just like, man. really been, you know, what now? It's, it'll be 16 years this year. You know, it's crazy. You know, November will be 16 years. So I'm just like, man, has it really been that long? And uh, so it just goes to show you, man, like, it's enjoy the moment and, uh, and everything. But no, Sean was one of the all time greats. And uh, like I said, one of the most fierce competitors you ever be around. All right, so I'm gonna ask you this: There was a commercial in there, um, <laughs> maybe 2008, 2009. I don't know. I can't remember yeah. the year. And you threw the ball. Ho tell me about this commercial. You know the commercial that everybody asks you about. Yeah. What happened to? to <laughs> what 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 did you do with the ball? Yeah, you talking about, oh, you talking about the oh, okay, you talking about that commercial. I thought you were talking about the Eastern Motors commercials we used to do. Uh oh. you talking about the um yeah, the NFL commercial we did where I had to throw the ball, had two balls in one hand, and I threw one, I threw the other, and then you hit the middle of the ball and they both split to two people. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we, I remember the day we tried to do that. And uh it took about, you know, it took a it took a few tries to keep doing it, you know, and uh until we finally got it. But but uh, it, it was definitely fun because people still ask me about it to this day. I wish I would get royalty checks off of it. I don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people always ask me, man, is that real? Is that real? And I said, man, that's the whole point of the commercial. I like you got to figure it out. But I will say it did take a couple of tries to uh, to get it. But uh, I remember shooting that because I had on some sandals that day. Right. Man, listen, JK, I'm like, well, people don't know it is like, all right. And I've talked about this before, man. Jason Campbell is probably one of the most financially responsible people <laughs> that I've ever met in my life. And I say this, um, and I've talked about it previously. One of my best stories from J. Cam is, like, we're at a wedding from one of our mutual friends, Donnay. He forgets his tennis shoes. We say we going out. <laughs> I wear a size 12. He wear a 13. He was like, hey, see. So everybody used to call me CP, he says. Hey, CP, what size, 
size that is. I said, it's 12. He was like, but you ain't got no more over there. I'm like, J Cam, you are rich, rich. I know you don't wear a size 12. All right. And and Cam and, and he tells me, he was like, bro, it don't make no sense for me to go buy a brand new pair of tennis shoes for one night. If I'm buying some tennis <laughs> shoes, I want to wear them for longer. All right. Cam, where did you get this financial <laughs> like like what like what 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 drove you? So even when you were rich, rich, to still operate like you didn't have nothing. like, And I'm not saying you never had nothing, but what I'm saying is, is like, what gave you that sense of frugality and, and, and to respect money the way you do? Because a lot of athletes don't. I tell you what, man, I didn't realize this growing up, but uh, like my parents and everything, I didn't know that they used to save all their summer money uh, that they had to send me off the camps and send me off to, to different things to make sure that I can support, they support my dreams so that I could have an opportunity. Cause you know, we grew up in a population of about 2000 people, you know, mm -hmm. until Mississippi, we were real small town right? and, uh, and everything. But my dad wanted me to get out, you know what I'm saying? He wanted me to see, see this, see the world, you know, see people and, you know, put my talents out there so they could be seen in front of people, but that required money. And that right. required him and my mom saving in the summer. So I realized that they had to, you know, they have to sacrifice in order for me to have an opportunity to reach my goals. And then I didn't realize it until I got older and realized, like, dang, if that's all they was making, they showed and made me feel like it. I always felt like we had plenty. And my right. dad and mama always made us feel that way because we didn't, we was, we was never in a need for anything and everything. Right. Then when I realized when I got older, I was like, dang, the reason we wasn't in a need for anything because they sacrificed so that we didn't have to be. And I was just like, so if I ever got into a position, I made sure I want to help my parents, want to make sure they was in a good spot, make sure, you know, you do something great for them and siblings. I said, but also at the same time, make sure I value, you know, like I value what what it is that you have, that you don't take it for granted. You know, right. I, like it wasn't important for me to have to show everybody what I got. You know, saying so a lot of people that get money and feel like I got to show everybody, you know, saying what I have just so they know I got it. You know what I'm saying? Right. I was just like, you don't need to do that. You know, right. you just need to be content with yourself. And right. I always say, I say one thing money going to do is it's either going, it's going to show you more of who you already are. Right. I said, so if you're a wild person, you get money, you're just going to be wilder. I right. said, if you're a neutral person, you get money, you still just going to, it's just going to show you that you are more neutral. I just right. like, uh, and everything. So my thing was, do I buy nice things? Yeah, I buy nice things. I buy my wife nice things. I was just like, but we don't feel like we have to buy it to be a show for anyone. You know, mm. so like we buy it, you know, if there's something that we really want or something or something that, you know, because we like it, we buy it for that reason. Ain't but no not, spending no money on no false pretense. Right. Exactly. Because it's just a waste at the end of the day. You right. know, and like it's a piece of material stuff that nobody really going to pay that much attention to anyways. You know right. what I'm saying? And, uh, and everything. So I've always said, man, like educate yourself on how to grow your money buy some properties, you know, get involved mm. in properties and, uh, and stuff like that. Instead of buying and spending all your money on cars, that's going to depreciate and you can't get that money back. Go buy you a few properties, buy you something to, that uses rental property, something that has residual income. Uh, you know, buy something that if uh, you want to sell it, you can sell it and still get your money back because you invested into it. You know, that's why I tell right. people don't don't rent long term. You know, a lot of people rent long term. And then as long as you keep renting, you're not paying towards no principle of owning anything. I just right. like so I just like and plus it helps your credit. You know, you have good credit. It keeps you in a position to buy different, buy certain things and not always have to spend out your money. You know, you come from the black community you're like me. A lot of times what we like to do, pay cash for everything. I right. learned like, you don't have to pay cash for everything. Let your money kind of work for you to pay certain things off over time. And uh, uh, well, you don't have to pay cash, but keep your cash. Right. Keep your cash. Like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like, only pay cash when you just have to have to. But, you know, we've always been in a position where we come from a place of fear sometimes. Like, if I don't own it, it may try to take it from me. Like, no, we got to get out of that mentality. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like, like keep your cash if you got good credit. Let your good credit work for you. That's the whole purpose of having good credit, you know, right. and, uh, and everything. And also just learning, man, like not be co-signing your name on with people. You know, like we are, we're so helpful and everything, but we realize, like, man, co-signing your name on stuff, you know, can cost you 
from wanting to get be able to do certain things because you got to depend on the other person to hold their hold their bargain of the deal up. So like, I always, you, like you really creating liabilities. Right. You're creating liabilities. So make sure you got assets and stuff, man. And just make sure, like I said, like you're you're positioning yourself. Cause we need to do is start learning how to build generational wealth for our families. You know, we, we are in a position to do that nowadays because our parents couldn't do it because they wouldn't allow to. You know, they right. wouldn't allow to have certain jobs. I was just like, now we can, you know, uh right. the thing. So our generation has a time to get ahead. This kid is making 18 to 22 year olds, making more than than 40 year olds, 50 year olds. You know, there's there's in the NFL now, guys are getting more guaranteed contracts, you know, pro right. basketball guys making a ridiculous amount of money. But like I said, if you don't learn how to be disciplined and take care of little, when you get a lot, you run through it so fast because you never knew what it took. You won't even know what you really had. You right. ran through it. Like you'd be like, oh, I had 20 mil. Well, you right. can't tell because you done burn it. Right. And my mom always told me, she said, Jay, I'm going to tell you one thing. She's just like, you better not come out of the NFL and don't have anything to show for it. And, mm. what, she, and what she meant is, why put your body through all the hurt, pain, the five o'clock workouts, the all of that stuff, if you come out of it and you don't have anything to show for it? Man. And the other thing I always learned too, man. People will spend your money for you. Ooh. That's why you gotta learn, learn what's going on, and learn how to operate your money and know where it's going. Don't let people tell you, "Oh, we got it." No, you got financial people. You got stuff that you do. Keep an eye on what you're doing. Know what's going on. You know right. what I'm saying? Depend on everybody else to do stuff for you. No, it's yours. Depend like get involved and know what's going on and know where it's going and who is going to, and that way you can make sure you stay ahead of it. Uh, but oh, uh, so. You know, so we got to get to that point, too, man. We got it's all a learning curve. All right. Last question. Who was the toughest defender? I don't care what team. I don't care what year. What defender out of all of the, the, the defensive players that you played against? What defender on a rival team was the toughest for you to play against that had you up at night before you had to see him? <laughs> uh, man, I would probably say. You know, back in the day, man, we used to play the Eagles a lot in our division in the NFC East. And, uh, you know, you always had to know where their guys were because, right. you know, they had the, the safety. You right. know, Dawkins. Yeah, Dawkins. You know, he was he was a really great player. You have to know where he were at all times. Uh, you know, DeMarcus Ware was a guy that played for the Cowboys that you always have to make sure he was uh, like a Michael Parsons type player. Right. Uh, like two of the guys that I know for sure, with three guys for sure, when I played against them, you always have to know was Troy Palomalu, Ed Reed, and then like Ray Lewis. Mm. And, uh, you know, and and the reason is because Troy and Ed can line up on the line of scrimmage and snap at the ball. They could be forty yards down the field. You know, <laughs> and, matter of fact, let's let let's start right there. Let's let's focus on Ed Reed. Why did Ed Reed keep you up at night? Yeah, he's a ball haul, you know, because you thinking he's gonna be one place and then he ends up in another place. And sometimes it was unorthodox, you know. You'd be like, as a safety, like, how can he line up over here and leave his area uncovered? It's because he's gonna end up in that spot at some point. And mm. but at the same time, sometimes he would do unorthodox stuff, but his teammates understood that. So his teammates had his back. So if he's supposed to be somewhere else. Somebody else would end up in that spot and it allow him to roam and make plays all over the field. Mm. So that's why I say it's the ultimate team game, you know, and everything. But he was one of those guys that would just he was very unique and smart about not telegraphing where he was going to end up at and be at because you couldn't look at the film and say, okay, when he does this, then he's going to be here. Nope, because every game he was just doing unorthodox stuff where he'll line up sometime and not pose a blitz and he would blitz. Mm. You know? So those are just things that, you know, he had free range to do. Man, Cam, where can we find you on social media? And if anybody wants to get down with uh, On The Victory, where can they find On The Victory? Yeah, you know, you find me on Twitter, man. Jcam underscore 17, capital JC, lowercase am, then underscore 17. On Instagram, it's, uh, you know, jcampbell17. Um and everything, but uh, people can also get involved with Own to Victory, man. Just go to ownTovictory.com, and you will see on there like how to become a member. You also see on there, you know, what we do from a subscription standpoint. 
and uh, what our NIL means for our student athletes. So, uh, you know, everyone just can go on there, like no pressure, but just learn more about it and uh, keep educating yourselves on it. But, you know, this is the way of the world. It's a new world. But don't just think about these kids making money, but you're giving them an opportunity to be able to help their family in a position where they can't because they have to be academically focused and they have to work on their craft in order to produce and and, and get and win games for us. No, absolutely. Hey, uh, Cam, you got to bring me on to Believe Auburn. Oh, yeah. You got to bring me on, bro. Yeah. So, nah, hey, but uh, get, one, 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 yeah. one of my good friends, man, a good guy, man, you know, somebody that might like a lot of times people talk about it like uh, if your mama like your friends, you got a good friend. And my mama love Cam. So, uh, man, man, thank you, bro, man. And, uh, hey, Casual Flex, P. Dukes, make sure you like and subscribe. We out.